Chapter 5 of Our Little Irish Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Little Irish Cousin by Mary Hazelton Wade. Chapter 5 Killarney. Mother, mother, Molly says I can go with her for a day at Killarney, cried Nora, rushing into the house quite out of breath. And indeed it was no wonder. She had run every step from her friend Molly's, which was a good half-mile away. Molly's father seemed quite rich in Nora's eyes. He had a farm where he kept three cows and twenty sheep. Yes, and a horse besides. Not a donkey, mind you. Two of Nora's neighbors owned donkeys. But Molly's father was so well off that he had a real live horse and a jaunting car of his very own. When the work was not heavy, the farmer sometimes took his family for a day's pleasure. "'If it is fine weather tomorrow, he promised Molly, "'you shall ask Nora to go with us. "'It will be a real treat for her.' How Nora's eyes sparkled as she told her mother of the invitation. Her cheeks were more rosy than ever, and as she laughed over the good news, her teeth looked for all the world like the loveliest of pearls. The next morning she was out of doors at sunrise to see what signs there were of good weather. Dame Nature was very kind to the little girl, and made the sun spread his loveliest colors over the eastern sky. There was a great scrubbing and cleaning before Nora was ready to start. Her mother combed and brushed her thick, long hair, and made it into two glossy braids. What did it matter if there was no hat to wear? She was so pretty she did not need straw or ribbon to make people stop to look at her bright, happy face, with eyes ever ready to laugh or cry. When she was dressed in her pink cotton gown, it was the only one she had, and her mother had washed an iron and mended it the night before, after Nora had gone to bed. She ate her breakfast and slipped over the fields to Molly's as happy as a lark. The horse and car already stood waiting at the door. Molly and Nora and Molly's sister, Bridget, sat together at one side of the car, while the jolly farmer, with his wife and baby, filled the other seat. Molly's big brother, Tim, was the driver. As they jogged along through the beautiful country, the party sang Killarney and other favorite songs. After a while, Mother's Molly started the harp that once threw Tara's halls, and everyone joined in with a will. When the song came to an end, the father told the children about an old harper who used to go wandering through the country. He stopped at every place to play the tunes that people loved so well. But that was before Molly and Nora were born, yes, before even the farmer himself was born. He had heard his mother tell about the old man, and how bright his eyes grew as his fingers drew out the tunes from the harp. Once upon a time there were many such harpers in the country. Those were the days of the Irish kings and lords. There were feasts and dancing and music in many a stone castle in those times. But now, alas, most of the castles are only ruins, where the kindly ivy covers the piles of stones, and the wind howls through the empty door and window places. One castle was the grandest of all. It was called the Hall of Tara, and was built on the top of a high hill. Molly and Nora had often heard of the doings in that grand building. It was the place where the Irish princes met together to choose their king. It was there that he was crowned, upon an upright stone that actually roared during the ceremony, at least so the story runs. The laws of the country were made in the Hall of Tara, and a great feast was served there before commencing business each day. Three loud blasts were sounded by the trumpeter to call the people together in the great dining room. Not only princes and nobles met in Tara's Hall, there were also poets and wise men, for those were the days when Ireland had places of learning where many scholars gathered to study history and poetry, the movements of the sun and stars, and many other things. Those were great days for old Ireland. "'Oh, see, see!' cried Nora. Molly's brother stopped the horse to let everyone see the beautiful sight before them. The lovely lakes, shut in by high mountains, were ahead of them. "'They are the jewels of Erin,' cried Molly's mother. "'They are diamonds sparkling on the breast of our country.' It was no wonder she spoke as she did. It would be hard to find any spot in the world more beautiful than the lakes of Killarney. As the horse started up once more, they passed high stone walls covered with moss and ferns and ivy. The branches of tall trees met together over their heads, 
with vines wound lovingly about their trunks. The whole view was so beautiful that even the children became quiet. No one felt like talking. "'We will not spend any time in Killarney Town,' said Molly's father. "'This is going to be a day outdoors, children. We'll have a rail picnic.' Molly and Nora clapped their hands. We must go to Ross Castle, that's sure, and of course you want to visit Muckross Abbey and hear the echo below the eagle's nest, the father went on. Castle Low and Glenna Bay, mountains tor and eagle's nest, still at Muckross you must pray, though the monks are now at rest. So sang the girls in answer. You must know that Killarney is the most beautiful part of the beautiful country of Ireland. One day is not enough to see all that is worth seeing. No one could blame the children for not wanting to spend any of their time in the little dirty town at the end of the lakes. The horse was driven close to the shore of Low Lean, or the Lake of Learning. This is the name given to it by the people of the country, because two universities once stood near its shores. The party got out of the jaunting car and sat down at the water's edge to eat their lunch. There were no cakes or pies, but nothing could have tasted better to the hungry children than the thick slices of bread and butter, the homemade cheese, and the rich goat's milk. And then, every time they lifted their eyes, they could see the green meadows on one side, and on the other, the mountains covered with purple heather and thick forests. Out on the clear waters of Low Lean were many little islands, looking like so many emeralds set in the silvery bosom of the lake. "'What lovely homes they would make for the fairies,' whispered Nora to Molly. She always spoke of the fairies in a whisper. Perhaps she felt they might be provoked if she mentioned them in her usual voice. "'I believe they choose just such places to live in,' answered Molly. "'I think there must be hawthorn trees growing there.' Both Nora and Molly believed in fairies. They had as much faith in them as many little boys and girls in America had in Santa Claus. They thought hawthorn trees the favorite places for the midnight parties of the fairies. It was in the shade of the hawthorn trees that these beautiful sprites feasted on dew and danced to the music of fairy harps. As the children sat whispering together, Molly's father began to tell the story of Low Lean. The little girls were only too glad to listen. He told the old legend of the time when there was no lake at all. A fine city stood here in its place, and in the city there lived a great warrior, whose name was O'Donoghue. Everything one could wish for was in the city, except plenty of water. There was one small spring, to be sure. A great magician had given it to the people, but he had made one condition, which was this. Whoever drew water from the spring must cover it with a certain silver vessel. It happened one day that the brave O'Donoghue drank more wine than he should. It made him very bold. He ordered his servants to go to the spring and bring him the silver bowl that covered it. "'It will make a good bathtub for me,' he said, and he laughed merrily. "'Pray, don't make us do this,' cried his frightened servants. He laughed all the louder and answered, "'Don't be afraid. The water will be all the better for the fresh night air.' The silver bowl was brought to the daring warrior, but as the servants entered the house, they imagined they heard terrible sounds behind them. They shook with fear as they thought, we are going to be punished for breaking the magician's command. One of the servants was so frightened that he left the city and fled to the mountains. It was well for him that he did, for when the morning came he looked down in the valley and saw no city at all. No sign of a house or living being was in sight. A sheet of water was stretched out before his astonished eyes. It was the beautiful Low Lean. As Molly's father repeated the legend, the children bent over the lake. Perhaps they could see the roofs of palaces or the tops of towers, still standing on the bottom of the water. They had heard of people who said they had seen them, but the children were disappointed. Perhaps, when they went rowing in the afternoon, they might yet catch a glimpse of the hidden city. Who could tell? Molly's father had more to tell of another man, whose name was also O'Donoghue. He pointed to a little island not far from the shore. It was Ross Island, and an old castle, called Ross Castle, was still standing there. The stone walls were now in ruins. They were overgrown with moss and ivy. But hundreds and hundreds of years ago, it was a great stronghold of Ireland's bravest warriors. The chief of them all was the daring O'Donoghue. Even now he cannot rest easy in his grave. Every seven years he rises up and, mounting a white horse, rides around Ross Castle. 
As he rides, every stone goes back into its old place, and the castle is once more as strong and grand as in its best days. But this is only for the one night. When the sun shines the next morning, a heap of ruins is standing there, where the owls and bats may keep house in comfort. "'How I should like to see the knight on his white horse,' said Nora. "'Yes, but I should be afraid, I'm sure,' said Molly. "'After all, the day is the best time to be outdoors, and my bed at home is the safest place after dark.' When the lunch was eaten, the whole party crossed a bridge that spanned the water to Ross Island. The children played games over the smooth lawns, picked flowers, and told fairy stories. Then Molly's brother rowed the girls out on the lake. Many a time he rested on his oars, while the children called out and then listened for the echo to answer them. "'There it is! Hark!' said Tim. A party of travelers came rowing toward them. They had hired an Irish piper to go with them. As he played a slow tune, the answer came back. Tim whistled, and the echo repeated it. The Nora sang the first line of, Come back to Aaron, and the echo sang it back again. But the afternoon was going fast, and the children could now hear Molly's father calling to them from the shore. They must get back to land as soon as possible. When they reached the car, they jumped in, and all started at once for Muckross Abbey at the other end of the lake. It had once been a great place of learning, but it was now in ruins, Ah, but such beautiful ruins, covered with mosses and creeping vines, how the ivy seemed to love the stone walls. Some of Ireland's greatest men were buried here. Poets and soldiers and wise men lie in their tombs. Nora and Molly stepped softly and spoke in low tones as they walked among them, half buried in moss and ivy. But they did not linger long. They loved the sunshine and the brightness outside, and were glad to get back to them. They took their places in the jaunting car once more and started on their homeward way. As they drove along, they passed the grand home of a rich Englishman. A long and fine driveway led up to it from the road. It was almost hidden in a lonely grove. Just as they drew near, a party of horsemen passed them and turned into the driveway, blowing their horns. They had been out hunting and were now returning. Arrah, they have a jolly life,' said Molly's mother, "'hunting and fishing and feasting.' This is the way they pass their days. But glory be to God, I have my husband and children and our little farm, and I am content. She might have said also, I live in the most beautiful part of Ireland. I can look to my heart's content at the lovely hills and lakes, the fields filled with flowers, and the cascades rippling down the mountainside. Yes, let glory be to God that the poor can enjoy these blessings, and it costs them nothing. End of chapter 5